pleasure to be here. Uh, didn't realize I have to drive through snow to get here, but you know, that's okay. I'm I, I, being from Cleveland. Uh, I'm used to to lake effect, so we see a fair amount of that. But thank you all for coming uh, to hear this talk, and hopefully I'll be a little bit provocative, and we can have a good discussion about how we think about uh, environmental issues and try and advance environmental values that I think we generally all share. Now, given that I currently live in Cleveland, or just outside Cleveland, I feel the need to say a little bit about my adopted city's hit role in the history of environmental protection as a prelude to talking about how we should think about environmental matters. Uh, Cleveland is the home to, among other things, uh, the Cuyahoga River, which has a famous, or some would say infamous, role in the history of environmental protection and environmental law in this country. In June 1969, June 20th, shortly before noon, some debris and oil on the surface of the river caught fire. And it was, or would become, a major media event. Time Magazine would publish this picture uh, in a story titled The Price of Optimism that talked about the nation's environmental crisis. Talked about the death of Lake Erie, talked about a river so polluted that it could catch fire. Uh, it was not only mentioned in Time Magazine, it was mentioned in National Geographic, the New York Times. It was grasped as a symbol for how bad our environment could become, how neglect by state and local governments, neglect by private industry, led to a degree of environmental desperation that is hard to fathom. Rivers, or at least material floating on rivers catching on fire, it even inspired a song uh, by Randy Newman, some of you may be familiar with, with the refrain, burn on, big river, burn on. Uh, for, those, for those of you for whom that's a, a somewhat dated reference, uh, R.E.M. also mentioned uh, this fire in one of their songs, um, appropriately titled Cuyahoga. Um, this became a seminal event in environmental history, a symbol of the need for greater environmental regulation, and in particular, federal regulation. And when I moved to Cleveland, I figured that it was worth learning a little bit more about this story and what happened and how the Cuyahoga River could have gotten to this state. And what I learned is that there are a lot of problems with this story. Beginning with this picture, the picture that Time Magazine published in the summer of 1969, this is not a picture of the fire from June of 1969, the fabled Cuyahoga River fire. There actually is no picture of that fire. Um, this is the closest there is to a picture of the June 1969 fire. I'm told if you look really closely in the bottom right-hand corner at better reproductions of this photo, you'll find wisps of smoke. Um, that column on the right is the story that appeared in the Cleveland press. It was not a major story. The fire was out within 30 minutes out before cameras could arrive, caused some minor damage to a railroad trestle that went over the river, but otherwise was something of a non-event. So the question is, well, that's interesting. So where did that picture come from? Well, it turns out that that picture, I mean, it's not, well, there was no Photoshop back in 1969. Uh, was, it's a real picture of a real fire on a real river, real picture of a real fire on the Cuyahoga, just not a picture of the fire from 1969. It was a picture from 1952, the year that the Cuyahoga River had a real fire, a fire that had it not occurred on a weekend would almost certainly have resulted in the loss of life, caused millions of dollars in damage, uh, destroying uh, docks and warehouses and other, other facilities in the shipyard in the flats part of Cleveland, but we could have been talking about uh, fires uh, not just in 1952, but fires in the 1930s, fires in the 19-teens, fires in the late 19th century. Um, there are over a dozen documented fires on the Cuyahoga River in the late 19th and early 20th century, but we could have even been talking about fires elsewhere. Columbus, Milwaukee, Baltimore, New York, Houston, Philadelphia, 
fires on industrial rivers were actually pretty common throughout the late 19th and early 20th century. Many rivers and waterways were used primarily for shipping and for siting industrial facilities. facilities industrial facilities would site along rivers because that would assure access to transportation, shipping lanes, and so on. And they were often used to dispose of materials. And so fires were common. Well, by 1969, it wasn't that things had gotten so bad that rivers would finally catch on fire. It's that that was a problem that had been solved. And by 1969, we had forgotten about a problem that 20 years earlier, 50 years earlier, had actually been rather common. Go back through the history of the Cuyahoga River, and I've only really focused in detail on, on the Cuyahoga River. You find local civic leaders, local businesses, local government folks realizing relatively early that fires on a river aren't such a great thing. Things burn. Things get destroyed. People are put at risk. Even at a time when what we currently think of as environmental values were not very strong, uh, where people were not as focused on uh, protecting rivers in their natural state, it was recognized that allowing oil and debris to accumulate on the surface such that you could create a fire hazard could be a problem and efforts were undertaken to address this problem, not just in Cleveland, uh, but in other cities. Uh, but nonetheless, this picture, the picture that Time Magazine published, the picture that until I, I published some additional research on this and then kind of went around emailing publishers and websites and whatever that reproduced this picture with st in stories about the 1969 fire was pretty common. I found it in the in-house journal of the Environmental Protection Agency, referenced in speeches by the president current president, prior presidents, heads of the EPA. This June 1969 fire is still the prism through which we think about a lot of environmental issues. Things getting so bad until in the 1960s, we woke up and asked the federal government to come in and save the day. But when the reality is there was an environmental problem that had been much worse, we recognized it, we identified it, we figured out how, with some struggle, how to address it in a way that would be successful and then moved on to the next set of environmental problems. And in looking at this research, things we find are, well, it's not just that river fires were a problem that arose and that we addressed. There are lots of environmental problems that we began to address more effectively uh, before the federal government got into the act. And if we had time, I could go through a whole bunch of examples. Here, I'll just give one. Uh, looking at sulfur dioxide concentrations, um, this is, Concentrations in the ambient air, these are the, this is the, the various data sets that we have. Um, one thing you learn when you research on environmental matters is our data on environmental conditions, uh, the data sets we have generally, even to this day, tend to be pretty poor. Um, for anyone who's concerned with environmental policy, um, the paucity of good data is, is shocking. Um, particularly given that we make policy on, on the data that we have. But this is the data we have, looking at sulfur dioxide concentrations in the ambient air in cities where, it was, where we could measure it from, the from 1962 to 1996. The federal government begins regulating in 1970. The downward trend begins well before the federal government gets into the act. The 1970 Clean Air Act doesn't actually begin to reduce emissions until well after 1970. You might even notice that the rate of reductions were even greater prior to 1970 than after. That's almost certainly due to what economists call diminishing marginal returns. The first increments of cleanup are easier than the later ones. Think about squeezing out a sponge. When the sponge is soaking wet, it doesn't take much to make water come pouring out, but getting every last drop requires more and more effort. And that's certainly true with most types of pollution. The point of this slide, and again, I could show you data on wetland uh, loss trends. I could show you data relating to uh, various types of water pollution, lots of areas. Um, it's not that what was happening in, before 1970 was necessarily better, but that progress was being made well before the federal government got into the act. And in some cases, progress was being made in spite of things that the federal government was doing. So in the context of wetlands, we began to see improvement in wetland loss trends long before the federal government stopped subsidizing the destruction of wetlands through agricultural and other programs. But it's not just that 
in many cases, federal regulations and were late to the game. So in a lot of cases, federal regulations don't do the things that we want them to do. In the context of air pollution, we have a Clean Air Act that certainly has helped us reduce air pollution in many places. But according to the National Academy of Sciences, requires policies that in some parts of the country can actually increase concentrations of pollution in the air rather than decrease them because of the way various compounds interact in the ambient air. We have provisions in the Clean Air Act that were designed to make fuel cleaner that didn't do much for the burning of that fuel, but did a lot to contaminate groundwater when methyl tertiary butyl ether, MTBE, which was added to gasoline because of a requirement in the 1990 Clean Air Act, uh, escaped and contaminated groundwater supplies throughout much of the nation and so on. We have a lot of environmental laws that actually don't achieve their environmental goals or cause other environmental problems. To give one example that I think is kind of poignant and that I think is at one level shouldn't be controversial because it, it, it seeks to do things that we all, I hope at least, are, think are worthy of doing. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Endangered Species Act. For folks that are interested, I edited a book on, on the ESA a few years ago uh, that talks about this and some other things related to it. Uh, the goal of the Endangered Species Act is to save endangered species. Primary mechanism of the act is, uh, consists of a listing process where we identify those species that are either endangered or threatened with being endangered, those species that are in trouble, and then a series of regulatory measures that get triggered by the listing of those species, regulatory measures that are supposed to protect those species. One set of measures that uh, limits the ability of the federal government to undertake activities that could threaten species, and then another set of measures which uh, threaten private landowners uh, with civil and, in some cases, criminal sanctions should they engage in actions that take endangered species, uh, take meaning kill, shoot, harm, modify habitat of endangered species. The, the listing process or the endangered species list is kind of like being put in the emergency room. We don't want species to be listed as endangered. We want their populations to be healthy and sustainable. We want them to be uh, growing. Uh, when a species is listed as, the, and, as uh, endangered, it, again, it's like putting it in the emergency room. We want these measures to get it out. The stated goal is to recover endangered species so they don't need these protections anymore. Well, the Endangered Species Act was enacted in 1973. And since then, we have listed over 2,200 species as endangered or threatened. In that period of time, as of this morning, I went on the Fish and Wildlife Services uh, website this morning, 59 species have been taken off the list. It doesn't seem like a great track record. 59 species put on the list of endangered and threatened have been taken off. But of those, according to the Fish and Wildlife Service, as of this morning, only half, 30, just over half, 30 of those 59 are identified by the Fish and Wildlife Service as being recoveries. That is, in only 30 of the 59 are the species populations doing well enough that they no longer need the act's protection. You may ask, well, what about the other 29? Why were they taken off the list? Well, they were taken off the list for one of two reasons. One, what the Fish and Wildlife Service calls data errors. There was a mistake in putting them on the list. We miscounted. A lot of endangered species are rare. We might not know how many there are. We might have recently discovered them. Um, we may make mistakes, right? We may think a species is, is less prevalent uh, than it is. Um, uh, the Tennessee snail darter of uh, the, the, the fish that uh, spawned the Tennessee Valley Authority versus Hill case in the Supreme Court uh, is an example of a fish that was uh, uh, more numerous and existed in places we didn't at first think. Um, uh, because when it was first discovered, it was discovered in a certain type of environment, and we assumed that was the only place it would be. So 29 were either were taken off the list either because they were data errors or because they went extinct. Out of 2,200. And what's really interesting, though, is when you look even at these 30, you find species that are doing better than they were doing when they were put on the list, doing better in many cases than they were doing in 1973. But what you can't find 
So you can't find a, a species on the list that recovered due to the regulation of private land. You can find species like, whoops, okay, my, there we go. Um, you can find species like um, peregrine falcons, brown pelicans, species that were definitely helped by the banning of DDT. Uh, the widespread use, widespread use of DDT uh, contributed to eggshell thinning on several bird species. DDT was banned for agricultural use in 1972. The Endangered Species Act was enacted in 1973. I think the evidence that we have certainly says the banning of DDT helped birds like the peregrine and the Arctic peregrine and the bald eagle and the brown pelican, but the Endangered Species Act didn't have much to do with that. There are species like species of kangaroo in Australia that is apparently doing better. I, I've never been to Australia. I, I haven't checked this out for myself, but it's in Australia. And whatever reasons there are for it doing better, it's not because of the regulation of economic activity or private land use in the United States. Uh, there are some species, a handful of species. There's a species of pygmy deer, for example, that uh, were probably helped by the restrictions on federal activities. Um, Federal, certainly, it is true that federal land management agencies, when forced to consider the effects of their actions on endangered species, do change the way they perhaps manage timber sales or perhaps uh, what type of predator control they do or don't engage in. And there are some species that appear to have benefited from uh, more conservation-oriented management of federal lands. But we can't find one that recovered on private land under the application of, of, of the take prohibition under section nine, the pro part of the law that says if a species is on your land or could be on your land, your ability to use that land is now conditioned upon getting approval from the federal government. And some researchers have looked at this and they've concluded, well, there's actually probably a connection because of the way the law operates and the way, types of incentives that creates for private landowners. And that's important because about two-thirds, if not more, of the species on the endangered list, at least the domestic species, which are about 1,700, 16 to 1,700 of the, of the 2,200 species are, are domestic. Um, a majority of those species rely upon private land for a significant portion, if not all, of their habitat. So we need to save them on private land if we're going to save them. Right? Just, doing the best we can in Yellowstone or in national forests isn't going to do it. We need to save them on private land. And why doesn't it work on private land? Well, because incentives matter. Sam, I have tons of quotes from conservationists on this. I use Sam Hamilton because he ran the, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Services programs in the state of Texas. Why Texas? Because Texas is a, is a state that has very little public land uh, very little federal land uh, uh, and, and very little state land. And so um, you really see the effects of the Nature Species Act on private land acting without, you don't have to worry about problems of, of as much of federal and private land interaction. And the way he described it was the way the act working, and he also, by the way, ended up being uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service Director under, under the uh, Obama administration at the beginning of President Obama's first term. The way he described the incentives the law creates is the incentives are wrong here. If I have a rare metal on my property, its value goes up, but if a rare bird occupies the land, its value disappears. Right? He's talking about Texas. You strike oil in Texas, you're happy. You're like one of the, you're like uh, Jed Clampett. Um, you're gonna make money. You find a black-capped vireo or a golden-cheeked warbler, you now know that your ability, those are two bird species uh, that are listed in Texas, if, you now know that your ability to continue to make productive use of your land is now conditioned upon getting approval from the federal government. That doesn't do much for your land values. Uh, in many cases, it drops those land values quite substantially. And there have been empirical studies about what this does. There uh, have been a couple studies looking in the southeast United States, looking at timberland, looking at landowner responses to the listing of the red cockaded woodpecker. Red cockaded woodpecker is a cavity nesting species. It's a bird that likes holes in trees. And it tends to like older trees because the, that's where it, those are the types of trees that are most amenable to building homes. And in the case of uh, uh, 
for cockaded woodpeckers, they tend to like tree, tree stands where the average age of the trees is 50, 60, 70 years old, pretty old trees. And what a couple studies found is that when, after the red cockaded woodpecker was listed, that when colonies of red cockaded woodpeckers were identified, the rate of timber cutting, the rate of timber cutting would increase and the average age at which timber was cut would drop. You can't cut the tree the red cockaded woodpecker is in, but under the Endangered Species Act, you can cut down the tree that's not yet old enough to be desirable for the red cockaded woodpecker and cut it down before a red cockaded woodpecker has, has time to arrive. And that's in fact what these empirical research found was happening fairly systematically. That timber companies, private landowners who manage land for timber for profit, change their practices to make their land less hospitable to red cockaded woodpeckers as a result of the Endangered Species Act. Letting them alone just to pursue their profit-seeking behavior was less harmful than listing the species. Another study looking at the Preble's Meadow jumping mouse, looking at landowners' um, response to its, its listing, a paper published in Conservation Biology, found similarly widespread hostility of private landowners to the species because of its listing. Um, and shockingly and distressingly found that the listing of the Preble's Meadow jumping mouse meant that landowners were substantially less likely to even allow scientists onto their land to conduct surveys. Why? Because they're afraid they might find something. And if they find something, they're afraid of the regulations that would follow. If we're trying to find a way to make private landowners enemies of endangered species, it'd be hard to come up with something more powerful than this. I mean, I suppose we could offer bounties on them. There are some species that are listed that we used to offer bounties on, and that's not why now they're endangered. Um, we generally gave up on that practice, and that's a good thing, but it, it's hard to think of something that could create more powerful incentives against conservation on private land than the law we have. It's a law that presumes, like a lot of our environmental laws, that the answer to environmental problems is trying to control and punish economic behavior or economically motivated behavior that might uh, have environmental effects or negative environmental effects without much intention for the broader incentives that are created or how that interacts with, this, with underlying institutions that we care about, like private property rights. Now, there are other ways we can think about endangered species um, or, and for conserving wildlife and environmental problems more broadly. And so let me talk about elephants and I'll just say, this is because elephants are cool, this is not a partisan uh, example. Elephants really are cool. They are what we refer to as charismatic megafauna, which is a fancy way of saying big cute animals. That, um, but elephants, I mean, they're, they are large, uh, they are charismatic, they have um, remarkably complex social structure. Um, they appear to be quite intelligent. Um, uh, they're quite majestic. I mean, I, I tend to think elephants are, um, are really neat. Um, and that's easy to think, living here. Um, uh, elephants aren't always viewed that way by folks that have to live near them. A former colleague of mine spent uh, some time in, in sub-Saharan Africa doing conservation research on, on elephants and came back with an inch thick stack of news clippings on what happens when elephants stampede, uh, when they destroy water supplies for rural communities, trample crops, um, in some cases uh, maul individuals. Um, in a part of the world where many communities are struggling to figure out how to feed themselves, leaving aside large tracts of land for large animals that will destroy your water supply, that will trample your crops and so on, is not, it's not a very appealing proposition, particularly given that there are places, there are people that will pay a lot of money for those elephants not roaming the plain, but dead, stripped of their ivory, uh, their hide, uh, and in some cases their meat. And throughout the late 20th century, we looked at various ways we could try and save elephant populations. And we had what was 
almost by accident something of, a, of, a, of an experiment in terms of two different dominant approaches. There was the primary approach, which shared a lot of the assumptions that our Endangered Species Act does, that, well, what we need to do is we simply ban killing of elephants and we create large protected areas, even if that means moving people off their land to do so, and we'll, we will um, have extreme penalties on anything that could harm an elephant, including in some cases authorization of, of, of rangers to shoot, uh, shoot, to, uh, shoot people on site who are believed to be engaged in poaching, and we will prohibit trade in elephant products. And that was the approach the United States government supported, it's the approach most wildlife organizations supported, it's the approach that got foreign aid, it's the approach that was adopted in places like Kenya. Uh, and what we saw was between 1975 and 1995, elephant populations in, country, in countries like Kenya that, draw, that adopted that approach, we saw the populations drop dramatically. Kenya from over 100,000 elephants to 26,000. What's interesting is that not every country in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that had a, elephant populations adopted this approach. Some countries like Zimbabwe, and it's kind of funny that Zimbabwe did this because Zimbabwe even then was not seen as a particularly market-oriented or property-friendly country, um, realized you know, it wasn't going to have the foreign aid. It didn't have the resources. It didn't have the relatively professional civil service to manage a program and manage park areas and the like. It wasn't going to be able to afford to adopt that strategy. So it did something different. It said to large private landowners, the wildlife on your land is yours. It said to rural communities, you can have something called appropriate authority, which was effectively, um, in everything but name, the uh, granting of communal property rights to elephant populations to rural communities. And these were fairly full, robust property rights. What do I mean by that? The local community could sell the right to hunt an elephant to some rich European tourist that wanted to come down and go on safari. And what happened over that period of time, that 20 years that Zimbabwe was doing this? Well, their elephant populations went up from 45,000 to 65,000. Elephants were transformed from being competitors for land, competitors for water, to a source of income. And yes, it involved killing elephants. And you know, I grew up hunting. I could never hunt an elephant. It's the, the idea at a certain level is repulsive to me. But it's less repulsive to me than a world without them and a world without them in the wild. And what Zimbabwe and, and some other countries in the southern tip of Africa discovered is that by making elephants valuable, you create more incentives for conservation than by trying to deprive them of all value whatsoever. And what's important about this story, and I should just say after 1995, in Zimbabwe at least, not in all the countries that adopted this approach, but in Zimbabwe where some of the successes were greatest, um, uh, due to various government policies, this, a lot of these gains were essentially destroyed because property rights became insecure and, and, and the like. Um, but we saw over 20 years what, what this sort of approach could do, and perhaps more significantly, um, and my slide's doing that again, um, there we go, um, what was happening to the landscape. Because we, don't, we care about elephants because they're charismatic megafauna, but ecologically we actually care about the broader ecosystem. We care about all the other species that interact uh, on a given landscape, we not, we're not just worried about the animal that makes for the nice postcard. Um, and what happened during, in Zimbabwe over the same period of time is that the percentage of land that was suitable elephant habitat nearly doubled. Ranchers were literally getting rid of their cows and converting their land to wildlife sanctuaries. Landers were running into agreements with one another to take, that, take out fence posts between lands to create larger and larger preserves to, to more fully replicate or recreate uh, the natural landscape. And this meant not only more elephants, but it also meant more of the habitat for other species that rely upon similar habitat. It created what economists would call tremendous positive externalities by doing more to preserve the landscape uh, overall. Uh, to the point that you had private ranches in Zimbabwe that were actually becoming the source of uh, pop, uh, uh, seeding populations for parks that were being created in other countries because you had stable and healthy populations existing uh, in Zimbabwe where you didn't in a lot of other parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, 
time permitting, we could give lots of stories like this. Um, and what I think the stories tend to show is that institutions, the underlying institutional framework we think about and we apply when we try to advance environmental values really matters. And that when we look around the world, we can see a pattern about what sorts of resources are threatened and are least sustainable versus those that are most sustainable. And the pattern that generally emerges is that those resources that tend to be unmanaged or politically managed, water resources, think California right now, tropical forests, a lot of ocean fisheries in this country, non-domesticated wildlife like those protected under the Endangered Species Act, especially on private land, tend to be those that are in trouble. But when we think about resources that are integrated into our system of property rights, mineral resources, temperate forests that are stable or expanding in, in, in much of the world, fisheries that are managed under things like ITQ or agriculture, um, not only domesticated wildlife in this country, but exotics, which can be effectively privately owned in this country. There are more scimitar horned oryx in Texas than there are in their native range. Uh, why? Because an idiosyncratic landowner likes them and likes having lots of more of them running around. Um, he can do that with scimitar horned oryx. He couldn't do that with spotted owls or something that's listed under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, where we manage things with politics, we tend not to see very productive results. Where we manage them with property institutions, we tend to see a move towards greater sustainability. A good example of this is what we've seen with fisheries. I don't know if any of you watched the show Deadliest Catch. Deadliest Catch, a reality show about cra crab fishery. Uh, it exemplified what is, occurs in many fisheries, what's called the race to fish. We realize that you can't just let people fish willy-nilly because eventually you will run out of fish. Believe it or not, people didn't always recognize this. You can go back 60, 70 years in the literature and you can find people talking about how you know, fish populations are inexhaustible. Um, uh, we realize how ridiculous that is uh, today. Um, and so a lot of fisheries will set a cat, catch limit. And they say the fishery will close when this limit is reached. And then there may be other restrictions on what type of fishing you can do, what type of boat you can use, what type of technology you can use, what type of net, and so on. And that tends to create a race to fish, which is why the deadliest catch show got started. Because when you force people to catch as much as they can as quickly as they can before the season closes, they will act uh, very aggressive. And they will be very reckless. And fishing, particularly in, in the Northern Pacific, uh, was quite a risky profession. What's interesting in um, what happened is that after the first season, uh, the Fishery Management Council adopted a property-based management system for that fishery, what we often refer to as cat share, some people call ITQs, doesn't, the name doesn't really matter, where they basically said each vessel has a proportionate share of the overall catch that's theirs they can keep it, they can sell. Um, and so there's no longer a need to catch as much as you can right away. And according to the producers of the show, this made for a kind of dull second season because they didn't have to rush to catch so much. Fewer people got hurt. The season was longer. Better, there was Less bycatch, which is well, the term we use for catching of non-target species, catching for things you're not trying to catch, which can have ecological effects. Better quality catch, because you're not catch, you know, there, there are fisheries that under a race to fish under traditional regulation where the entire year's catch is caught in a matter of days. So if you want to get it in the supermarket, all you're going to find is frozen. Um, longer season means greater availability of fresh seafood. Oh, well, but the producers of Deadliest Catch discovered is that they'd have to find other ways to make the show exciting. So I guess now apparently they have like side bets and stuff among the boats as a way of increasing the incentive to, do, to go back to their old ways. But what we found in the fisheries where we've allowed ITQs to be or catch shares to be adopted is that they are far less likely to be unsustainable. There's been there have been studies published in Science and Nature and other publications showing this globally. Uh, that the ability to accommodate other ecological protections goes up, the rate of bycatch goes down, the various environmental indicators for fisheries improve. Fishermen start to actually care not about this year's catch, but next year's catch because they have a stake in the underlying resource. They're like the rural community 
in Zimbabwe that has a stake in the resource being there, not just now, but tomorrow and next year and the year after that. And in some countries where, where cash shares have been adopted, you even see the fisher count, fishery councils, the profit-seeking resource users, being more aggressive about reducing catch limits than the government is because they don't think the government's being precautionary enough in, in assessing what's a sustainable catch. United States, you can't do that because of antitrust rules, but maybe we'll get, I have a, for those that are interested, a, years ago I did a paper on, on what, how we should modify antitrust laws in, in this sort of context to allow resource users to be more conservation oriented. Moving towards a more property-based approach produced substantial gains. And it's something that we've, we could, a story that we can tell in lots of contexts. Now I want to say a few, little bit about pollution and then I, I know I want to leave time for questions. So let me go through these, I'll go through these last few slides relatively quickly. Um, protecting property rights means, property rights being secure, but it means also protecting property rights against private harm and that's pollution. And that's a long-standing principle in our legal system. First reported case is William Aldred's case from 1611. And it's amazing, you read that case, or at least the English portions of it, parts of it are in Latin. And I, I don't read Latin, but um, English portions of the case sound like contemporary debates about pollution. You have a pig farmer, and the, his farm smells, and the neighbor doesn't like it. And the neighbor says, you're effectively excluding me from my home because of this pollution. He doesn't say the word pollution, but that's what he's describing. And what does the pig farmer say? The pig farmer says, but what I'm doing is economically valuable. You shouldn't have so sensitive a nose. What does the court say? The court says, in Latin, the, your right to use your property only goes so far as, 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 as not to injure your neighbor. Protecting property rights doesn't just mean it doesn't, property rights don't get regulated unnecessarily. It also means we care very seriously about the fact that sometimes well-intentioned productive use of property has harmful effects on neighbors and we should care about that. And our legal system hasn't always done a good job of adhering to that principle and insofar as we've shifted these questions to the political process, not only has that often meant less effective control of pollution, it's often meant less equitable control of pollution because the political process uh, is often uh, uh, more responsive uh, to those with greater access and greater wealth, uh, certainly as compared to, a legal pro to, to the legal system or the judicial system. Uh, so we should care about protecting property rights uh, from pollution, not just from government regulation. We should also recognize that the under overall market process that property rights encourage produce tremendous environmental gains. It's, it's the green thumb of Adam Smith's invisible hand. This, this is copper wire. Uh, many of you might not even realize why copper wire is important, but when I was a kid, if you wanted to talk to somebody, that's what you were using. You had your phone that was attached to a wall that came in like two colors. At one point it was only one. Um, and copper was the way you communicated. Well, copper is expensive, it's also, pretty environmentally intensive in terms of digging it out of the ground, smelting it and processing it so you can turn it into a coils of wire that you can then string around to communicate through. Because it's expensive, people thought there might be a better way. And they came up with a better way, fiber optics made from silica. You might have to worry about running out of copper. You don't have to worry about running out of silica, sand. Um, turns out this is a more efficient way of communicating. You can, I don't know how it works, but blinking light through a fiber optic strand communicate, transmits far more information than a copper wire could. It's less environmentally destructive and intensive to make, so cheaper for consumers, less environmental harm. Why? Because making things with stuff costs money and there's an incentive in the market process to try and do more with less. And we don't even use this as much as we used to anymore. Now we use wireless, we use satellites. And yes, there are still environmental effects. A lot of cell phones and the like require rare metals, which sometimes can be difficult to obtain and, and we need to be care, concerned about how they're disposed of. But the medium of communication is now not a scarce resource. The environmental effects of communication, while they still exist, again, dropped dramatically. 
whenever we're thinking about improving environmental conditions, we want to be very sure we're not short-circuiting the process that gives us these sorts of gains because they are tremendous. And they don't come because a government regulation, regulation says you must do it. They come because people are pursuing innovation. Um, so I guess the one way of thinking about what I've been saying is, is that we typically talk about environmental problems as market failure that need to be solved by some sort of command and control regulation, some sort of restriction on economic activity. But I think it's more helpful to really think that we fail to have markets or more properly we fail to build upon the underlying institutions of markets, property rights, voluntary exchange, protected by the rule of law. While it's difficult to do, starting and building on those institutions is a more efficient and effective and equitable way of trying to advance environmental values than a more centralized uh, regulatory model. In terms of what that means going forward, let me just throw out a few ideas of what, how I think we should be approaching these things. First, do no harm. Kind of is crazy that the left hand of government is subsidizing problems that the right hand has, and if, or you can be right versus, I don't, this is not a, uh, an ideological company. One hand of government is subsidizing and creating problems that then the other hand has to clean up. That's crazy because we end up paying for it both ways. Uh, it's amazing how much environmental harm is subsidized and encouraged by government policy, um, typically at the behest of special interests, although often at the behest of, of, of uh, well-intentioned efforts to, or as a result of well-intentioned efforts to provide other things. But we should be very concerned about the environmental problems that our government subsidizes. We should be protecting property rights. We should be concerned about the, the property owner whose land, when it's overregulated under some of the Endangered Species Act, goes from being a potential home for endangered species to uh, a lot to not a home for endangered species. Something that becomes, or creates, a, makes endangered species a liability for landowners. But we also need to be concerned about private harm. We should be concerned about the fact that some states have right to farm laws that insulate agricultural producers from the traditional law of nuisance. Things like that are not protecting property rights. We should seek to find ways of expanding market institutions where we can to cover ecological resources. And sometimes it'll be difficult. I like the fisheries example because for a long time when, when researchers talked about property rights in fisheries, how do you do that? I mean, the fish move and they swim around. And, and we had to be creative. It's hard sometimes. But if you don't know what your underlying framework is, what principles are guiding reform, you're less likely to have policies that produce the sorts of results you want. I also think that in a lot of cases, we need to de decentralize decision making. We need to reopen the laboratories of democracy, allow state and local governments to do more, at least especially with localized environmental problems. Because in a lot of cases, we know that there are problems that we haven't quite figured out what the best way is to, to solve them. I tend to think that these other principles are good guides for how to think about them. Um, but in any event, the details are going to matter and we're going to need to, to experiment and, and to develop new ways of dealing with these problems. In all cases, we need to remember that, that institutions and incentives matter. Last slide, um, cautionary note. There's no going back to the Garden of Eden. There's no human civilization without massive environmental impact. The question is not how do we eliminate the environmental consequences of the lives we lead. It's how do we manage those consequences so that they are acceptable. How do we find the, the, the best available or the least bad way of controlling environmental harms, uh, preventing environmental consequences we don't want in a way that's compatible with other values that we have. Uh, it may not be an uplifting and optimistic note to end on, but I think it's an important pragmatic note that's important. There, anyone that comes to you saying, I can solve every environmental problem and everything will be perfect, is lying, delusional, or both. There are no perfect solutions, but there are some approaches which I think are less bad than others. I will stop there and I will take questions until I'm told to stop. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. Clear opinions such as you just given us. Uh, where, where are the obstacles? Are there, are there entrenched interests who just like to see bureaucracy at the federal level increase? Or is it the wrong thing thinking of some of the environmental groups? Or are some of them better than others? How, what is the landscape of that? Well, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think most people that deal with environmental policy are well-intentioned. Um, but 
have accepted a certain set of premises which when we operationalize them into policy don't produce the results we want and and in some areas we've seen rethinking about that so in the area of fisheries for example um, most of the major environmental organizations have come around to a property rights in fisheries um, because they they see that it works and they see that all the other approaches that have been tried are failing and not necessarily just here but in, in other parts of the world um, that can't afford to fail as, the way we do in the sense that you know we have a lot of money we can waste on a lot of inefficient regulations lots of parts of the world that can't so that's an area where environmental groups have come around and um uh in water conservation um there are a lot of environmental groups especially at the local level that have uh, recognized that water markets outperform uh, water use regulations in terms of conservation in terms of protecting in-stream flows um, and some of them are, are quite for lack of a better word radical in how aggressive they think um, those institutions need to be adopted I mean, in terms of making water rights real, property rights, um, uh, don't treat them just like conservation easements, treat them like real, fully transferable property rights in perpetuity, um, protected by the Fifth Amendment. I mean, and I tend to think that that happens where people have experience with these sorts of approaches. They tend to see the value of them. There are certainly some environmental groups that have rediscovered the value of nuisance law as a more effective, for all its flaws, and you know, nuisance law has warts, um, as, a, as often a more effective way of, of dealing with these problems than trying to beat your head against the wall with the legislature or deal with regulatory systems that often care more about whether or not your permit was properly complied with than whether or not you're actually causing harm. Um, that said, there certainly are interest groups um, that benefit substantially from the status quo. Um, uh, yesterday, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in a, in a case involving mercury regulation, and you know the issue. It's an administrative law issue, but you have big groups of industry on both sides of that case. Why? Because the outcome of that case creates big winners and losers, and there are some companies that stand to, from a competitive standpoint, to win uh, from the EPA's regulation being upheld, and some that lose. Uh, and uh, you see that a lot in environmental policy. You see a lot of programs that are sold as environmental programs that are really about helping a particular industry or particular companies capture market share, uh, and it's a problem. And it makes it hard. Um, it makes it hard to reform laws because you have. It's not just. It's not just a fight over what's the best policy. There are economic interest groups in many cases that benefit from bad, costly regulations and. You know, they will fight to keep the regulations that help them, and that's true in a lot of areas, right? I mean, we have a we have a we have a cronyism problem in lots of areas of policy, and 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 environmental law is no different. So I enjoyed all the uh, images in your presentation uh, and your comments about the link between photographs and environmental consciousness. One you didn't use that I'm sure everyone in the room has seen. It's someone holding up a pine glass in front of one of the city of Toledo watering things out sure. the area. Sure. Water. Sure. Um, the, the story there, if, you, if you're thinking about it in your lens, usually it is about too much property protection for farmers who are letting run off in the river system. So I'm wondering how uh, we're turning from water conservation sure. to, to um, Yeah, well, I mean, protecting property, right, doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want with your land. It means you get to make productive use of your land in ways that aren't harmful to your neighbors. Um, in the context of water pollution, one of the big problems we have is what we call non-point source pollution, right? Runoff, runoff from farms, from streets, uh, paved surfaces and the like. Um, and that's a problem, not just here, but that is, that is the dominant water quality problem the country faces. And it's a hard problem no matter what your approach is because you're dealing with millions of dispersed sources. Um, so, there is, I should say, that's the sort of problem where there isn't some kind of ideal scenario, but, but the way I think you approach that is um, the right to use your property does not include the right to harm others. Um, there are uh, consequences of not taking care or adopting best practices when it comes to the way you apply fertilizer and the like. Um, uh, and if that in the aggregate uh, is causing a, a, a problem to the community at large. That is the sort of thing that certainly the traditional police power would justify addressing and that I think you want to look at uh, 
addressing that from from a property rights standpoint. Right? What we're concerned about is what landowners are doing that's actually causing that effect. Now, does that necessarily mean you directly regulate the landowners uh, you know, one by one? Maybe. Uh, there have been uh, uh, efforts to, to deal with that by treating a watershed, for example, as an aggregate and, and allowing the watershed to come up with um, uh, various ways of reducing the aggregate loading of pollutants or nutrients, if it's a nutrient runoff issue, within that watershed. Um, and we've seen some, some ex pilots of that that, that, sh that are promising. What tends to happen in that scenario is the large em producers or the large emitters are, end up subsidizing smaller landowners to adopt better practices. Why? Well, because if the aggregate loading isn't reduced, who's going to be the target either of a governmental action or even a private nuisance action? It's going to be the larger guys. Um, but if it's cheaper for them to help smaller landowners to, to adopt better practices, they may work with that. It's, it's in some respects kind of creating, I mean, to put it in kind of more theoretical terms, creating a, 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 a not involuntary firm that manages that watershed and, and, and imposing a binding constraint on it to figure out how to get its own house in order. Um, I think thinking about, th trying to think about things in that way can be helpful. Similarly, uh, allowing more state and local experimentation with those sorts of things, I think, will help us learn about the information costs, which are endemic in these sorts of areas, but are endemic whether we're talking government regulation or some sort of property-based approach. I mean, by adopting regulation, we don't get to wish away the information costs. We don't get to, I mean, but allowing more experimentation may allow us to discover how to make it work just as experimentation in fisheries led us to discover how catch share programs could work. Uh, and, um, uh, I think as long as state experimentation doesn't, isn't allowed to become upwind states, and Ohio is guilty of this, uh, it, polluting downwind states, which for some pollutants that's a concern, for some it isn't, um, allowing greater experimentation can help us discover what are more property-oriented ways to deal with those problems. But non-point source water pollution, huge problem. And we, you know, my, my argument is not shutter the EPA and walk away and hope everything works out great. It's, it's think more seriously about the underlying institutional framework that we're applying to these problems. And in a lot of cases, it's going to require a lot of work. Okay, this should have been your early comments about the lack of the data. Yes. Policy, uh, in a lot of the narrative, the media, there are two narratives of sort of climate change. And as I read through this, it strikes me that really one of the questions is, quality of the data or the data source. So I just wonder if you can comment on the source of the quality of the data that different groups use to underlie that particular thing. Yeah, I mean, climate, um, I mean, I could do a whole thing on that. Um, I mean, my bottom line is um, human activity is contributing to climate change. Everything we know about the atmosphere suggests it should be. Um, the effects may not be as catastrophic as Al Gore suggested in his movie, but they're large enough that we should care about them and um, we should think about, in particular, how do we accelerate innovation such that we could actually make climate change a manageable problem because the sort of emission reductions we would need to stabilize atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases are so far beyond our capability that everything we do now with climate policy is, is make-believe. I mean, it's not, it's not serious because it doesn't do anything to get us to the goal we need to make get to and so we need to think about innovation policy and, and we're not but so that's my bottom line on climate in terms of the data um, you know the problem with climate they, so we there's two issues with environmental data one is do we have data at all and then two is the data reliable and climate if we're going back earlier than the late 1970s um, temperature data has problems that we know that we know what they are and then the question is are we accounting for that so if you're talking about land-based data where weather stations tend to be tend to be in areas that over time have become more urbanized. There's an urban heat island effect. Best way to think about this, airports tend to be a degree or two warmer than the surrounding countryside because of all the blacktop. I mean, buildings and stuff result in, in... So are we adjusting for that in the land record? And then if we're talking about beyond, you know, earlier than the late 19th century, then we're talking about, you know, proxies, which we hope are reliable. And there's a debate about how reliable they are. Uh, since the late 70s, we have pretty good data. We have satellite data from 1979 to the present. 
Um, we have weather balloon data, more or less uh, same period. Um, and those data sets show warming. Um, and they show warming that is consistent with, with, with um, uh, what you'd expect from human activity in terms of where the warming is and so on. Um, two things about reasons I like the satellite data. One is um, the satellites are really precise. There was a, a paper published in, I think it was in Science, that showed that we could measure, uh, the satellites could be used to measure temperature differentials at night between full moons and new moons from the reflection of, of sunlight, that they're that sensitive. So I mean, they're, they're pretty sophisticated. The other thing that's interesting is that the, the two guys that run the satellites um, down at the University of Alabama at Huntsville are both skeptics. So if my view is if they're finding evidence of warming, it's hard to argue with that because their priors are warming is a, is a minor problem. Um, now, I mean, they still tend to think that it's less of a problem than some others think, but they, their data, I think, has tended to show that, that you know, while, while it is, shows less warming than the models have predicted, it does show warming that does appear to be uh, attributable to human activity. Um, but it, it, we got to, data matters. I mean, with fra I mean, there are a lot, all kinds of environmental issues where we just in general have to pay attention to where the data comes from and then view it in light of where it comes from um, because a lot of times even the best data we have is not so great. And you know, given all the things we try and do in environmental policy, when you look at what we're investing in the data that would be necessary to make those programs effective, it's, it's real, the, the mismatch is jarring um, uh, in the sense that there are a lot of programs we have that if we need a lot more data if we don't have any hope to, to, to succeed and we don't do it because there's, there's less of a political constituency for good data than there is for other things. But one last short question, I'll, I'll, a short answer. Well, I'd kind of like to know more how the laws restrict private property and why that decreases um, the endangered species rather than... Sure. So, um, so in the endangered species context, um, Section 9 of the Act prohibits the taking of endangered species um, and can be sub you can be subject to both uh, civil and criminal penalties for that. Take is defined as pretty much any activity that can harm a species, including adverse habitat modification. So if you have land that is suitable habitat for a listed species, making mo modifying that land without government permission um, is a violation of Section 9. So what... Habitat supports that species. What about the government just subsidizing well, I, I've argued, I mean, I have a, I, I've argued in, sev in several papers that, um, A, if we compensated landowners under the Fifth Amendment for takings in that context, you would dramatically reduce those incentives. Now, that might be really expensive. So the other thing we, we've noticed is that in, in, there are some federal programs, um, primarily in the context of wetlands and habitat for waterfowl, uh, so programs like Partners for Wildlife, um, Wetland Reserve Program, um, North American Waterfowl Management Plan, uh, and then some private programs that are run through groups like Ducks Unlimited and the like, which have found that in a lot of contexts, the amount you have to pay a landowner to get a landowner to make minor modifications in their land use practices to accommodate species actually is really low. That most landowners, not all, but most, generally get like the idea of being told they're doing something good for the environment. And if you give them a small check, they like that even more, but it costs far less than actually buying the land from them. So on a per acre basis, if you just look at, and this isn't a, this isn't a, a, a perfect comparison, but if you look at um, wetland restoration and conservation under programs like Partners for Wildlife and the like, which are again often done in conjunction with um, uh, private conservation groups, and compare that to mandatory mitigation um, under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, where landowners are required to create wetlands as a condition of getting permits, um, or compare it to the cost of taking compensation when the federal government loses a case, you're talking about a small fraction of the per acre cost when you do a voluntary approach uh, and are just trying to give landowners small incentives for better behavior. So, so my argument's been is that is that if you moved in the direction of uh, away from from regulatory restrictions towards providing incentives, um, 
you could be far more effective and there are reasons to think that dollar for dollar you'd actually be more effective in the status quo and that if you're not, okay, saving the government's power to, you know, to, to take necessary land through eminent domain as a last resort would still give you that added safety net um, but would um, all, you know, largely eliminate the negative incentives you see from existing regulations. Um, so again, my, I've argued that it would be both cheaper and more effective. Um, some people don't think it would be cheaper um, uh, and, and are worried about being able to afford it. But I think there's, there's a lot you can do in that regard to, to encourage landowners um, uh, to do what uh, we would like them to do. And you know, the, the environmental movement in this country began as a landowner-based conservation movement. The first two park rangers killed in the line of duty were not employees of any government, but were employees of the Audubon Society. That was buying up land for birds that were endangered because the birds were being hunted because their feathers were being used in, in women's hats at the turn of the last century. Um, and so private landowners, private individuals said, how do you do this? Well, you conserve it. And how do you conserve it? You own it and you post it and you protect it. Um, and you know, I think drawing more on that tradition could be a lot more effective than, than what we've done. And I promised a short answer that wasn't one. But um, thank you again. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming today.